Hi everyone, in this video we're going to talk about air pressure and some of the effects that it has, some of the real life demonstrations that show the power of air pressure. So let's start by talking a little bit about what air pressure is. Well, it's the pressure exerted by the atmosphere. And what is the atmosphere? It's just the collection of gases that surrounds the earth. So basically we have all these gas particles flying around and they're striking everything they touch and they're exerting a certain pressure. And we measure that pressure in a variety of ways. You can measure it in atmospheres, so at sea level it's about one atmosphere. Or we can measure it in, you know, 760 millimeters mercury, 760 torr, or 14.7 psi. Now I like 14.7 psi because that kind of, you can all relate to what 14.7 pounds feels like. And what that number means is that every square inch that the atmosphere is touching, the atmosphere is exerting a force of 14.7 pounds on that. So if you look at every single square inch of, like, hold your hand up. One square inch of your hand, so one inch by one inch, there's 14.7 pounds of force being exerted just on that one square inch. Add up all the square inches around your hands and your fingers, we're talking hundreds and hundreds of pounds of force pushing on just your hands. So why don't your hands just get crunched into a little ball? Well, because, of course, your body is pushing out with that same 14.7 psi. So... Really, when we kind of manipulate things, we can see the power that this air pressure has that we're completely oblivious to. Well, let's start with this can crush demonstration. Now, you probably saw this already in your chemistry class, but let's go through it. Basically, you take a soda can with a little bit of water inside, and you heat it up. So we have these little black dots, which represent air particles. And before, we have, well, regular air particles out here, four regular whoosh lines, regular pressure arrows, and inside these are heated up, so they're super hot and super fast. So I go big whoosh lines and big pressure arrows. Now, nothing crazy is gonna happen here because it's open on the top. It's open here so the pressure can kind of equalize. These particles can move out, other particles can move in. It's kind of at equilibrium. So what we do in the can crush is we flip this can, and that's the key. We don't just take it and place it in icy water icy cold water, we invert it, we flip it into icy cold water, and what that does is it seals off the opening. So we've now gone from an open container to a sealed container. So whatever gases were in here before, they're now trapped in there. So now we have sealed off our volume. Well, what's going to happen to the particles inside now? They're, they were moving super hot, but we took it away from the heat source and we added it to now a cold, cold, cold source. Uh, so they're going to slow way down slow way down. So I'm going to do four tiny little whoosh lines and tiny little pressure arrows. Did anything change outside? Maybe by a couple degrees, but nothing significant. So we're going to do regular arrows and whoosh lines out here, regular pressure out here. So nothing really changed out here, but what happened inside? Well, the temperature dropped, so the pressure dropped. This is a great example of that relationship. Temperature goes down, pressure goes down. So now we have low pressure inside here, which means the particles are striking the walls weaker. So they're pushing the walls out very weakly now. Well, before they were pushing in with a lot stronger. I mean, it was regular atmospheric pressure, but now inside it's very weak. So what's going to happen? The atmosphere is going to crush that can, and that's what we saw. So I have a setup going in the back. Now, this doesn't work every time, but let's see if we can get it to work. All right. I kind of had to time it with how long this video would take me to get to this point. So here I have my soda can with a little bit of water in it on the hot plate. You can see the steam pouring out the top. Here I have icy cold water. I even made it really, really cold by mixing salt in there. And let's see if we can observe that reaction. Ah, there we go. Okay, that was a good one. Now, what we can notice, not only did it crush, but look. See how much water ended up inside that can? This was basically empty before. It had a tiny bit of water, and all that water kind of rushed up into that can. And just to see here, this is probably one of the best can crushes I've got. Look how thin that can is. It's hard to see on the video. But, I mean, you couldn't, with your hands, you couldn't squeeze the can to be that thin. I mean, it just shows the power of the atmosphere there. So let me put this back in place, and let's talk about why it kind of filled with water there, because that's kind of an interesting thing we can talk about. So before, when there was no change in the pressure, 
the atmosphere was pushing down on the water here, it was pushing down on the water here, and it was pushing down on the water here. There was no change. But by cooling these gases down, I lowered the pressure, which means this arrow got a lot weaker. So why did that can fill with so much water? Well, the atmosphere pushed this water down, it had to go somewhere, so it ended up pushing this water down and then it went up. So that explains why that water goes up. So again, great demonstration of how temperature can lower pressure and how the atmosphere can exert its force. Well, next let's talk about breathing. Something you do every day, you probably never attributed the atmosphere to it. So how do you actually breathe? If you asked a kindergartner, you would say, oh, that you just kind of suck in air particles and then you push out air particles. Well, that's not exactly true. There is no real kind of suction force. You can't just pull things in this world. We, we don't have the power to just pull things towards us. We can only push. So here's what's going on when you breathe. What you really do is you take your diaphragm, which is the muscle at the bottom of your lungs. I may be a little off on the biology here. But your diaphragm is going to kind of move down and stretch your lungs out. It's going to kind of move down and expand your lungs. So what happens in your lungs is the volume goes up. Okay? Inside your lungs, volume goes up, stretches your lungs out. What effect is that going to have on the air pressure inside? Well, it's the same number of particles moving at relatively the same speed. Temperature didn't change. So N is constant, T is constant, volume goes up. Those particles now spread their force over a larger area, which means the pressure goes down. Volume goes up, pressure goes down. A great real-life example of this relationship. So now we have low pressure in the lungs. Well, what's happening outside? There's no change. Me moving my diaphragm doesn't affect air pressure outside. So now we have low pressure in the lungs, higher air pressure outside. What's going to happen? The atmosphere is going to force air particles down our trachea into our lungs to equalize that pressure. So that's how you breathe in. You don't really suck air particles. All you do is create the low pressure necessary for the atmosphere to shove air particles down your throat. Well, how do you breathe out? It's just the opposite. You take your diaphragm and you return it to its original position, kind of move your diaphragm up, and that shrinks your lungs. So now, the volume of your lungs just went down. You shrunk those lungs. That means there's more, uh, less surface area for those particles to strike, so the pressure is going to go up. So now you have high pressure in your lungs and regular pressure outside. What's going to happen? Air is going to be forced out of your lungs. So again, when you breathe, you're not really sucking in and blowing out particles. All you're really doing is moving your diaphragm and creating the low and high pressure in your lungs for the atmosphere to do the work. So it's a great example of the volume pressure relationship, great example of the power of the atmosphere. Let's talk about straws. Again, if you ask a kindergarten, how does a straw work? They would say you, you just suck the liquid up. Well, again, you can't just pull things towards you. I don't have the power to just pull things towards me. I can only push. So what's happening here, this is if you just had a straw in a cup just sitting on the table. Well, there's kind of atmospheric pressure pushing on everything. It's pushing down on this water. It's pushing down on that water. But because, of course, there's air inside the straw, it's also pushing down on the water in there. And it's, you know, it's pushing on the cup. It's pushing on the straw. It's pushing out, like, on both sides of the straw. It's pushing this way. It's pushing that way. There's air pressure touching everything, but it's kind of at equilibrium. Well, what do you do when you use a straw? Well, you put your mouth on the straw. I'm not going to draw the whole thing. You put your mouth on the straw, and you remove air from the straw. Now, you don't do this directly. It's just like we talked about in breathing. You, your diaphragm uh, shrinks down, your lungs expand, low pressure, and the, the air is forced up. But we don't need to go through the whole explanation again. Basically, what you do is you remove air particles from the straw. So now, you don't create a perfect vacuum. I'm not going to remove all of them. But we'll show that we remove some of them. Now, what effect is this going to have? Well, you've reduced N. N has gone down in a sealed container, volume constant. And we're assuming you haven't changed the temperature of this significantly, so T is constant. So if N goes down, what's the pressure going to do? going to go down as well. You have, you have fewer soldiers fighting in that battle for you. So you just reduce the pressure, which means this pressure arrow is going to drop. And really, this pressure is going to drop too. And this is why, like, if you try to imagine a straw made of, like, saran wrap or something, or, like, you know how a straw comes in those, like, cheap plastic things where you kind of, like, 
puts it, and then you throw the wrapper away. I mean, in theory, that wrapper, if you cut the ends off, you could act as a straw, but as soon as you remove the air, the atmosphere is gonna kind of push that in. So a straw needs to be strong enough that the atmosphere isn't gonna crush it this way. So this really isn't a factor here, but this is the factor that we care about. Notice, the pressure down here has dropped, so it's pushing on the water down with less force then the atmosphere is pushing down on this water. So what's going to happen? Well, the atmosphere pushes this water down, it has to go somewhere, down, has to go somewhere, and it's going to force that water up. So how do you drink out of a straw? You remove particles, which creates the low pressure necessary for the atmosphere to push that water down and up the straw. Great example of how um, the atmosphere works in, in this relationship right here. This leads us into a pump. A pump is very similar to a straw. Imagine you dig a well and you find water down here and you want to get that water up. Well, you build a pump, which is basically a giant straw. It's a big pipe. And this pump up here kind of serves one function. And what it does is every time you crank the handle, you're removing air particles from the pipe. Now, I don't know the exact mechanics of you know, how to manufacture these, I'm not an engineer. But through some mechanical process, you're forcing air out of the pump, uh, out of the pipe here. So let's talk about the pressure that's happening before. Well, we have air inside this well, it's pushing down. Air inside this pushing down. And of course, there's air inside the pipe pushing down. Everything's at equilibrium. Well, when you pump the handle, let's say you remove some of this air here. Are you going to create a perfect vacuum? No. But let's say you remove some of that air. What have you just done to this arrow in the middle? You've made that weaker. Because again, when you reduce the number of particles, you're reducing the pressure. You're taking soldiers away from that gas, and there it's getting weaker. So what happens? The atmosphere pushes this water down and up. So again, how do you pump water up? You remove air particles, which allows the atmosphere to push that air up the pipe. Now while we're on the topic of straws and pumps, Let's talk about this idea of a theoretical maximum height. If you had some superhuman here who could pump a perfect vacuum, could remove literally all the air, imagine we have a tiny little a cup down here and a straw that's miles and miles and miles long. In theory, if you could remove all the air from that straw, you know, if it was, of course, sealed at the top, if you could remove all the air, the atmosphere is going to be pushing down. Can the atmosphere push that up forever? And the answer is no. And here's why. And, and people always say, well, yeah, eventually you're going to run out of water down there. No. I mean, in theory, if this is an infinite source of water, could it drive that water up forever? No. Why? Because as this water rises, it gets heavier and heavier and heavier. Heavier and heavier and heavier. So it's rising, it's getting heavier, heavier, and heavier. We can't forget about gravity. It still exists. So the force of gravity, the weight of that water, notice I'm not using mass, I'm saying weight. I mean, they're basically interchangeable uh, in certain contexts, but in this case, weight is a force pushing down. And the weight of that water is going to get heavier and heavier and heavier. Now, what's pushing it up? The atmosphere. And again, if we assume that we have a perfect vacuum in here, there's no air pressure pushing it down, so the only thing pushing it up is going to be the atmosphere. I'm just going to write ATM for atmosphere. Now, is the atmosphere infinitely strong? No. It's 14.7 pounds per square inch, or it's one ATM strong. Now, of course, that changes with uh, your elevation. But basically, you're going to get to a point where the atmosphere can push the water up to an equal amount of force that the weight of the water pushes down, and it's going to stop. And that height can be measured. It's about 10.3 meters, or about 34 feet. Now that's at one ATM of pressure, so at sea level. If you went up to the top of a mountain, let's say you went to you know, some Denver, Colorado mountain up there, would you be able to pump it higher or smaller or, or shorter in theory, theoretically? And well, since the pressure is lower, that means this atmosphere arrow is weaker, which means you can only pump it to a smaller height. Another interesting fact is this does not depend on the diameter of the pipe or the straw. It's because it's a force per square inch or per square unit, it doesn't actually affect it. So this is the theoretical max height you can always use. A okay? couple more quick demonstrations here. Barometer. 
So I want to show what a barometer is. And let me kind of bring this camera over here again. All right. So this is kind of stems from an experiment uh, scientist named Tor Riccelli was doing. Of course, Tor is named after him. If I take this tub of water, this is just regular water here, okay? Grad cylinder filled with water. And if I cover this with my hand and flip it in, it's going to stay. Right? I don't know if you can see it in the camera, but it's going to stay here. And why is that? Well, it's because the atmosphere is pushing down on this water stronger than the weight of the water is pushing down. This is easy. But if I made this super long, I mean, how high could I make this before the atmosphere can't support it? We just said 10.3 meters or 34 feet. So this grass cylinder would have to be 34 feet long before the atmosphere couldn't support the weight of that water. So the idea behind a barometer is that these early scientists were trying to figure out a way to, to kind of show that the atmosphere is not infinitely strong. Now, if they had a 40-foot-long piece of glassware, they could have done that, but they didn't. So instead, they experimented with heavier liquids. And what's the heaviest liquid you could think of? Mercury. Mercury is 13.5 times more dense than water, which means mercury, the atmosphere can only support a column of mercury 13.5 times shorter than water. So when you do this with mercury, imagine this were about three feet long. I cover it with my hand like this. I have a bowl of mercury, a container of mercury. I cover it with my hand and I flip it. With water, when I move my hand, nothing happens. But with mercury, you would actually see it drop down. And why would it drop down? Because the atmosphere isn't infinitely strong. It can only support a certain column of mercury, a certain weight of mercury, and it would drop. So essentially, you have this column of mercury partially supported. And what do you have in that very top part? Nothing. You have nothing. And what do we call that in chemistry? A vacuum. Because basically, it was full, and it just dropped down due to its own weight, leaving nothing behind. So let's show what a barometer actually looks like. Let's talk about its uses. Okay. So a barometer is going to look sort of like this, where you have a bowl of mercury and a tube of mercury. And you flip it in and you move your hand from the bottom, and it ends up being partially supported, but not all the way supported. If you did this with water, in order to get this effect, it would have to be more than 34 feet tall. But with a mercury barometer, it only has to be, well, 13.5 times smaller, or about 760 millimeters high. That's where that 760 comes from. On a normal one atmospheric pressure day, the atmosphere can support a column 760 millimeters high. So we can use this to kind of gauge the pressure on a day-to-day -day basis. Imagine it's a high pressure day, high air pressure, which generally means good sunny weather. It doesn't always perfectly correlate, but generally good sunny weather. Let's talk about what, whether the barometer is going to go up or down. Let me kind of erase this. Well, what supports this to begin with? It's the atmosphere pushing down on the mercury in the bowl. So on a high pressure day, Strong air pressure pushing down. Strong air pressure. What's that column going to do? What's this going to do? It's going to rise because it's going to push down and up. So on a high pressure day, the column is going to rise. Well, let's see what, if the opposite's true. Let's say it's a low pressure day, which generally means bad weather or stormy. Well, now we have low pressure pushing down. Low, low pressure pushing down. What's going to happen? The weight of this can't be supported by these weak atmospheric arrows, so it's going to drop. So on a low pressure day, the column's going to drop. So a barometer can help us kind of gauge the weather. And if you calibrate this properly, you can actually get actual readings. Last thing we're going to talk about is called a manometer. Similar to a barometer, but notice it's open on one end, whereas the barometer was sealed. The idea here is there's two competing pressures. There's a pressure in the bulb, P, bulb. And that pressure in the bulb is pushing down on this side of the mercury. On the other side, we have the pressure in the room, P room. And that room pressure is pushing down on this side of the mercury. So it's these kind of two competing forces. And the difference in the height of mercury is going to tell us which of those is stronger. And if we quantify this by adding up, measuring the heights of those two columns, we can actually quantify the pressure. Now, I tried to draw this even. If this mercury level is even to that mercury level, what does it tell you about the two pressures? They're equal. Well, what if they're not equal? So let's look at this example. Here I showed a room pressure of 755, P room, 755 mmHg. I showed a height of 21 millimeters here and 42 millimeters here. And we're trying to solve for the bulb's height. 
Well, how do we figure that out? First thing you do is you find the difference. 42 minus 21 is 21. So the difference is 21, and these units are millimeters, so it's going to be 21 mmHg, millimeters of mercury, difference. So the bulb is either going to be 21 more than this or 21 less than this. So here's what we got to do. you got to sort of think this logically here. What's stronger, the bulb or the room? Bulb or the room? Well, the bulb is pushing that down, and the room is pushing that, that down. Notice the bulb is able to push the mercury down harder than the room is, which tells us that the bulb is stronger because it's able to push its side farther down than the room is. So since the bulb is stronger than this, what we're going to do is add the 21 to that, and we're going to get our pressure in the bulb. So 755 plus 21 is going to give us 776 millimeters of mercury. Let's see another example. So here, oh, got sealed off at the end, so I gotta make up a new number. Let's assume that this height here is uh, 31. Okay? So in the room I have 761, 40, and 31. What's the difference in height? Well, it's 9. The difference is 9. So the question you have to ask yourself is the bulb gonna be 9 more than that or 9 less than that? Well, let's figure it out. The air pressure in the room is pushing down here, and the bulb is pushing down here. Which is stronger? Well, in this case, it's the room, because it's able to push its side down more. So the room is stronger. So this, which is already given, is stronger than this. So what's the bulb's pressure going to be? You take 761, you subtract 9 from it, and that's going to be your pressure in the bulb. 752 mmHg. Last thing I'm going to show real quick, these manometer problems can work the other way too, where I tell you the bulb pressure, and your job is to find P room. Well, same thing applies. You just got to think it through logically. 52 minus 31 is what? 21. So that's the difference. So we got to ask ourselves, is the room 21 more than this or 21 less than this? Well, what's stronger, the bulb or the room? It's going to be the bulb, right? Because the bulb is pushing its side down harder than the room is. So since that bulb is 21 stronger than the room, I'm going to go 741 minus 21 to give me 720 mmHg for the room because it's weaker. Now, I've got to be careful here. I need to put a decimal point at the end to show that it's still rounded to the nearest ones place because technically if you leave it as 720, that's technically rounded to the nearest tens place. So my answer is 720 point mmHg. Okay. So I hope this uh, cleared up any questions and showed you kind of the, press, the power of air pressure.